Hey everyone, it's great to see you. Uh, I feel like it's been a few weeks, and so I just want you to know uh, you've been missed, you've been in my thoughts and prayers, and I'm just, uh, again, so honored to get a chance to be here. If you are new and you have no idea who I am, again, my name is Eugene, and I have the privilege during this uh, season of being able to visit Willow about once a month and just trying to encourage you through the Word of God. And so with that in mind, thank you. So with that in mind, you know that whenever I have the privilege of teaching here, I just love the tradition that many people around the world share. And it's out of reverence and respect for God's word. For those who are able, I want to encourage you to rise to your feet. Can you do that right now, whether you're at the atrium, watching at the other campuses, here in the sanctuary, or maybe even watching online. There's just something just so incredibly humbling to know that there are literally billions of people around the world who believe and worship the same Jesus and out of reverence for God's word that we stand. Today, friends, we're going to be reading Psalm 68. It's a long psalm, and so what I want to do is read verses 1 to 10. I'm going to read that over the congregation, and then together in one voice, we're going to read verses 32 to 35. So my sisters and brothers in Christ, listen now for the word of God. May God arise. May his enemies be scattered. May his foes flee before him. May you blow them away like smoke as wax melts before the fire. May the wicked perish before God. But may the righteous be glad and rejoice before God. May they be happy and joyful. Sing to God. Sing in praise of his name. Extol him who rides on the clouds. Rejoice before him. His name is the Lord. A father to the fatherless, a defender of widows, is God in his holy dwelling. God sets the lonely in families. He leads out the prisoners with singing. But the rebellious live in a sun-scorched land. When you, God, went out before your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook. The heavens poured down rain before God, the one of Sinai, before God, the God of Israel. You gave abundant showers, O God. You refreshed your weary inheritance, your people settled in it, and from your bounty, God you provided for the poor. And now together, friends, let's read 32 to 35 together in one voice. Sing to God, you kingdoms of the earth. Sing praise to the Lord, to him who rides across the highest heavens, the ancient heavens, who thunders with mighty voice. Proclaim the power of God, whose majesty is over Israel, whose power is in the heavens, You, God, are awesome in your sanctuary. The God of Israel gives power and strength to his people. Praise be to God. Amen. Please have a seat. And so, Father, thank you again that as we gather together here in the sanctuary around the building, around campuses and those who might be watching and participating online, We know that your Holy Spirit is transcendent. We ask, we beseech the presence and power of the Holy Spirit to be with us. God, my sincere prayer is that every single person might have an encounter with the Holy Spirit. God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be pleasing in your sight. And all God's people said, amen, amen. Well, friends, as you know, we've been in this fairly long series about all the things, a study through Psalms. And next week, Steve Gillen's going to come and wrap it up. But today, I have the privilege to share with you 
about a very important topic that emerges not just in Psalm 68, but really throughout the totality of Psalms and also throughout Scripture. And it is this word called hope. Now, I'm going to explain to you why I asked your design team to give me the most beautiful graphic design of the word hope. But let me first begin by acknowledging where do we place our hope in. Now, we're sitting at church, so I know that we're supposed to think and say we place our hope in Jesus Christ. And it's true. But I want to just take a step back and acknowledge where are the other places that we sometimes place our hope in. Now, there's three significant spaces, three significant areas where we sometimes are tempted or we place our hope in. So let's talk about those three things. The first one is simply I, me, myself. We have a high view of our skills, our abilities, our, our ability to have control. We want control of our lives. And there are times, even though I say I'm a follower of Jesus, I place my hope and trust in me. I'll do it. I'll accomplish it. I'll earn it. I'll save it. And the truth is, if we're honest with ourselves, we realize that we simply are not in total control of our lives. As much as I may want to, the reality is the Bible says that every single human being, including myself, we've fallen short of the glory of God, and as a result, I cannot save myself. In other words, I hate to break it to you, you are not God. That's the first thing. The other category is simply on others. We place our hope. Now, there is a level of appropriate hope, hope in friends, hope in our spouses, hope in our coworkers, hope in parents, hope in children. But when we place eternal hope in other human beings, we all know that no one is perfect not just us, but other human beings are well. And as a result, if you were to place your hope and trust in others, inevitably, you're going to be disappointed. So as a result, if you were to place your hope in me as a human being, I want you to realize, while I think I'm a decent person, while I seek to honor Christ with my life, you are going to be very, very disappointed. Now, the other category is simply what we call world or culture. Let me finish the word culture. <laughs> I ran out of space. <laughs> is that we realize that while this world, there's expressions of beautiful things, we also realize the world is not as God intended it to be. Yes, there's expressions of hope and joy and love and kindness and empathy, but all you have to do is simply turn on our news stations, simply flip the pages of our newspapers to realize that the world is incredibly fallen and broken. There is injustice and evil and pain. We have kids that are in migrant centers. We have shootings in Wisconsin. We have viruses that are spreading. There is war and famine and the list goes on and on and it breaks our heart. And so we realize that our eternal, deep hope cannot be placed in me. It can't be placed in you or your loved ones, and it can't be placed upon the world. Now, you know where I'm going. Our hope is to be placed in the one who created hope. Our love is to be placed in the one who created love. Our trust is to be placed in the one who is only trustworthy. This God who made the cosmos and the universe, this God who sends his son, Jesus Christ, to us, we are to place our eternal hope in this 
Jesus. Now, I want to then explain what kind of hope is needed. Because when I see the word hope, especially discussed within church Christian context, sometimes I get a little nervous. I get nervous because I feel like we have a very rosy, unrealistic, cursive perspective of what hope looks like. I think about the sun coming out in Chicago, which is rare. I think about nice little flowers. You see how artistic I am? (laughs) The kind of hope that we need isn't unrealistic. The kind of hope that we need isn't naive. The kind of hope that I'm speaking about is not simply ignoring the realities of pain and brokenness in my world and in the world that we live in and we put on a fake smile and we sing clappity clappy happy songs and then we say, you know what, just have hope in Jesus. That's not the kind of robust, profound, biblical, theological understanding of hope that is going to speak truth to our life and the brokenness of our world. That's the kind of hope that I want to speak to you about today. And let me give you an example. Years ago, when I was a college student. I went to college in California at a school called UC Davis. And I was a youth director at that time. And so every weekend I drove about half hour to serve at a church in Sacramento, California. And every single time I walked into the sanctuary, I was confronted by this very large sign right above the doors. And every single week this sign bothered me. Now, it was meant to be an encouragement, an encouragement to those who walked into the sanctuary. But for some reason, every time I looked at this sign, I paused for a moment and said, something doesn't feel right. Now, what did this sign say? This sign simply said, leave your worries outside before you enter the presence of God. Now, I know what it was trying to say. I get it, but in my mind, I think to myself, if I can't bring my full, authentic self to the presence of God, then what kind of relationship do we have with God? If I can't bring my mess, my shame, my brokenness, my fear, my anxieties, my doubt, if I can't bring this to God, then what we're basically saying is let's have a nice, packaged, comfortable, soft, domesticated version of relationship with Jesus. I want a hope that is able to speak to all the mess and complexities. In other words, friends, I want you to realize that you can bring your full self to God. Here's why. God can handle everything that you bring. He's God. He's God. You think God can't handle your doubts? You think God can't handle your mess? You think God can't handle the deep theological questions that we wrestle with in your life or in this world that we live in? If I could summarize the entire totality of all the things series, if I could just sum it up in one sentence, I would say you can bring your all entire authentic self to God. God knows everything. In the same way that our brother Tracy was welcoming us to the invitation of communion table. And he just did a phenomenal job. I'm voting for Tracy for president, FYI. And so here's Tracy reminding us that nothing that the Samaritan woman shared with Jesus was a surprise to Jesus. In other words, Jesus knows everything about us, and there's something very profound about that. You see, I can prove to you in a few minutes that God loves you, every single one of you. Let me give you a story. My wife and I, we just celebrated 
23 years of marriage. Praise God. I don't know if you know this, but my wife is a marriage therapist, which means I have lost every single argument in 23 years. It's not funny. So 24 years ago, I met, at that time, this woman named Min Hee. I was pastoring at a church in Seoul, South Korea, and I kind of knew about her, and eventually, after a few months, I was able to conjure up the courage to ask her out. I watched some really bad Korean dramas just to get some ideas how to do this. If you've never watched Korean dramas on Netflix, don't do it. It's going to ruin your life. And so I finally picked up the phone. FYI, if you're unsure what I'm doing, millennials, this is a phone, FYI. I called up Min Hee and I said, hey, this is, uh, my name is Eugene. I've met you a few times. I'm wondering if you'd be interested in going out on a date. She said yes. So uh, last week I was in Korea. We only had one week to spend time before I was coming back to the States to finish my school. We had dinner, it was nice and pleasant, and during dessert, we're sitting across the dining table, she's looking at me like this, just smitten by my charm. <laughs> Excuse me, this is my story. I really thought Midwest folks, I was told, were really polite. Um, so she is staring across me, and I remember this, and then she asks what I consider to be the scariest question a human being, especially an introvert like myself, could be asked. She looked across and she said, Eugene Shi, in Korean, Eugene, tell me everything about your life. And I got scared. <laughs> like in that moment, like millions of synapses crossed my mind. I have no idea what that means. <laughs> And I was literally, in that moment, I was wrestling with the question in my own head. This is the question. Do I tell her everything? Everything. You know what I mean by everything? Our past, mistakes, closets, or skeletons in our closets. Do I tell her everything, or do I tell her the Christian testimony version? Have you heard the Christian version? I've mastered it. It goes like this. First, you look at that person to acknowledge that you've heard the question. You look off to the side. <laughs> you look upward as if you're pondering the wisdom of the Holy Spirit. You breathe. And then you look at that person. And you say, Min He, I once was lost, but now I'm found. I once was blind, but now I see. Now, here's why I genuinely wrestled with this. Because in my mind, at that moment, I thought to myself, if this woman even knew a glimpse of everything that I've experienced and struggled with in my life. There is no possible way that she could be interested in a second date. If she had a glimpse of all my sins, all my failures, all my mistakes, every single ungodly thought that entered my mind, there is no way that she would say yes to a second date. Do you understand what I'm saying? Here's why I know God loves you. God knows everything about you. Everything. Don't be scared. He knows everything about you. And why is this proof of God's love? Because he's still here. He's still pursuing after you. He's still saying, you are my beloved, my child, my son, my daughter. 
That's the kind of hope that we need, a raw, transparent, honest, where we bring our full self and why I'm saying let's place our hope in Jesus. Now, let's dig in deeper. We need a hope that is able to speak to the complexities and the brokenness of life, which includes beautiful things, but if we're honest, to pain and suffering as well. Every single week we encounter things globally, nationally, in our community and in our lives where we think to ourselves, if there is God, why does blank happen? Think about the shootings in Wisconsin. Think about bombs that are falling upon Syrian children even as we speak. Think about the fear that is going about the real issues of the pandemic of the coronavirus. On a personal level, someone earlier came up to me and asked for prayer about cancer in her particular life. Several weeks ago, we were visiting my mother-in-law who's in her 80s. She had a fall recently, broke her arm. This is a few months after breaking her ribs. This is a year and a half of breaking her back. She loves Jesus, a retired pastor who wakes up every single morning at 4.30 to go to early morning prayer meeting every single day. And so sometimes we ask the question, why do bad things, unfair things happen to me, you, us, them, to good people? How can we have and ask for people to have hope in the midst of it? And here's the last thing that I want people to walk away with. The worst thing that we can say is stop asking questions, just hope, suck it up, be happy, clap to nice little songs, that's the hope that we need. That kind of answer drove me away from the church as a teenager because it didn't speak to the reality of the world that we live in. A German theologian by the name of Jorgen Moltmann. He writes an incredibly important book called A Theology of Hope. And in this book, he says, genuine hope is not blind optimism. It is hope with open eyes which sees the suffering and yet believes in the future. So let's talk about this robust hope. Another theologian by the name of Gerhard Voss who was a professor at Princeton, my alma mater, in the uh, early 20th century, he tried to articulate the words to describe us having hope in the midst of a broken world and how is it and why is it that that tension exists. This is what he says. Reflect on this carefully. The kingdom already here and not yet fully arrived. As Christians, we believe that Jesus is Lord. We believe that God conquered death. We believe that Jesus is who he says he is and that Jesus will accomplish what he says he will accomplish. If you agree with that, say amen. Amen. We believe in this and yet, If we're honest and realistic and not naive, we realize that we live in, on this side of heaven, in a very broken world. And there's questions. Dr. Voss's articulation is this. It's because the kingdom is already here and yet not fully arrived. What does that mean? It means that it introduces us to something called tension. We live in a world of tension. I don't know about you, but I hate tension. I want things nicely packaged, good answers. I want things to be black and white. I wanna make sure everything is convenient and comfortable. That's what I want. I want a very straight line from where I'm at to the glory of heaven. That's what I want. I don't know about you, but I want a nice, smooth yacht cruise line all the way to glory of heaven. But what it means to be a follower of Jesus, if you were to look 
at the journey and the path that the Israelites took from Egypt to the promised land, trust me, it wasn't a straight line. It was more like, here's Egypt, they went down here, circled around here, went around here, they made some bad choices, bad mistakes, went over here, and they finally went to the promised land. I don't know about you, but this sure looks better than this. In other words, I want to assure you, Jesus Christ declared that we are in the reign of the kingdom of God. Right now, as we speak, the kingdom of God is upon us, but he also says that it is not in its full, absolute, total glory that there will come a time when Jesus, who is trustworthy, who says that I will return one day to restore all things back onto the one who made all that is good and beautiful, that is the tension of the kingdom already here and not yet fully arrived. Are you with me? So let me go a little deeper what that looks like. Right now, we just began the season called Lent, a period of 40 days as we march towards the glory of Resurrection Sunday. I love Resurrection Sunday. I love Easter Sunday. I love the fact that we're in our best suits and dresses. The hats come out. It is a beautiful celebration. But do you also know we don't have to wait till Easter Sunday to celebrate Resurrection? We celebrate that every single day. Every single day for us as Christians, it is Resurrection Day. We believe the tomb is still empty. We believe that God conquered death through Jesus. We believe that Jesus was able by his blood reconcile us back unto God our Father. But if we're also honest, we're not in perfect totality of the kingdom. We realize that even today we experience the reality of Good Friday and Silent Saturday. Now let's talk about this. What is Good Friday? Good Friday is also known by some as Dark Friday or Crucifixion Friday. It's the day that Jesus Christ unjustly, in a brutal, evil way, a mockery of a trial, was crucified. Can you imagine the despondency, the depression, the discouragement of the disciples, the women and men that loved Jesus Christ. They experienced the valley of valleys. Their, their teacher, their mentor, their rabbi, their Lord died. Silent Saturday, we're able to look back now and say, oh, we know that Jesus is alive. But can you imagine how difficult the silence and the uncertainty of that day between Crucifixion Friday and Resurrection Sunday must have been. I don't know about you, but for me, this is the most difficult space in my life. I, like, I don't like not knowing. I don't like uncertainty. I don't like not knowing what's going to happen. It creates anxiety and fear to kind of foster in my life. Now, what is real hope? Real hope is acknowledging that there are going to be moments, days, seasons of our life where it feels like we're experiencing Good Friday in our life. Real hope means that there's going to be moments where we experience silent Saturday. Is there anyone else here who prayed this prayer, God, how long must I wait? God, where are you? God, help me. I don't sense or see you in the midst of this situation. That's the kind of real faith and real life that I'm speaking of. So what is hope? There's two very dangerous ways of interpreting what transpired and hope. One dangerous way is simply to ignore Good Friday, Silent Saturday, and we just jump to Resurrection Sunday. We're blind and naive to everything that goes on in my life, their life, her life, around the world, and that's all it is. 
another dangerous interpretation is to have a hope that is held captive by Good Friday and Silent Saturday, and nothing is able to speak to those things. It's true, some of us right now, in a room like this, I know for a fact some of you right now are in a season of Good Friday. I know that. I know that some of you are in a season of silent Saturday right now, and here's why. I could tell you with integrity to have hope, because Resurrection Sunday tells us that Jesus is able to speak to Good Friday. He conquered death. He conquered and defeated Satan. In other words, while we can acknowledge pain and evil and brokenness in the world, he, God, the one and only God, is greater than that which is in this world. Let me say it again. God is greater than that which is in this world. Even though we might feel lost, and doubtful and uncertain, I want you to know that Jesus speaks truth and clarity to silent Saturday, meaning even though the future is unknown to you and me. So right now, as we're all fixed with the news of the coronavirus spreading around the world, I don't know what the future holds. I just still know that in the midst of it, God is in control. I'm not suggesting that it may not impact you or me or our communities. All I know is that God conquered death, God's in control, and he promised us one day, mm, I am going to restore all things. That's the hope. That's the hope, friends that we need. So then, what does Psalm 68 tell us? Well, Psalm 68 can be summed up by the word, not just hope, but to remember. To remember God in the midst of broken Friday, silent Saturday, in the midst of fear and anxiety. Remember God. Remember what God did for you. Remember his graciousness, his power, his might. Remember that God was a way maker. Remember that God was a miracle worker. Remember that God freed you from bondage and slavery. Remember that God spoke to the most mightiest, powerful person, Pharaoh, and said, let my people go. You got to remember because if you're like me, sometimes I can get so consumed by the here and now. My memory is very short. And God says, if you're worried about today, worried about tomorrow, remember what God has done for you. Remember, rejoice, recount, tell those stories. Tell yourself those stories. In Psalm 68, in remembering, we learn that God is mighty and powerful. Verse 1 and 2, it says, May God arise, may his enemies be scattered, may his foes flee before him. you got to realize that David and the people of Israel, the people of God, they were constantly being bullied or attacked by other enemies and countries. And this was a reminder that God, he's powerful and he's mighty. The second thing that we learn is that God is merciful and caring. In other words, yes, God is authoritative and powerful. He's the one true God. He's almighty, all-powerful, all-present, all-knowing. But it's not just that. Have you ever met someone that has power or authority by name, by title? But they're just not very kind. They're not caring. They're not empathetic. They're not compassionate. Our God is merciful and caring. We learn in this particular psalm, verse 5 and 6, that our God is a father to the fatherless, a defender of widows. He looks for the lonely. He leads prisoners out with singing and joy. But it's not just those two things. We learn that God is personal and loving. He's not just authoritative. He's not just compassionate, but this God draws near to you. 
Listen to what it says in verse 7. When you, God, went out before your people, God goes out before us, but he also marches with them. He's with them through the desert and wilderness. Friends, I want you to know the words from Matthew 28, 20, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the ages. You're not alone. The reason why I can encourage you to be open with your pain, your shame, your scars, your mess, the reason why I can say with pastoral confidence that you can bring all those things is because Jesus is already there. He's already there. Let me close with this story. One of my favorite TV shows, and this surprises me because I just love watching all things sports, but a few years ago, about 10 years ago or so, I started getting into a show called Antique Roadshow. Anyone watch Antique Roadshow? Raise your hands. So some of you, many of you like Antique Roadshow. It originally began as a documentary on the BBC from the UK. And since then, it's like spread through other countries, including the United States. And if you don't know what Antique Roadshow is, it's a group of experts, experts on all things antiques, furniture, jewelry, dishes, things of that nature. And they travel from town to town, city to city, and people are able to bring uh, what they think might have some value or story behind it. And I remember watching an episode many, many years ago where this one particular woman just nonchalantly carries what she says is, uh, this is my, um, um, this is my uh, spaghetti Tuesday dish. And uh, I was told by my guest that it could be, I don't know, it could be somewhat valuable. And I love that moment when the expert, usually in a very arrogant British accent, grabs the particular item and then handles it very differently. Begins to kind of examine it close, far. And I love that moment when they begin to like describe that dish that's a bit more profound than Spaghetti Tuesday dish. And that moment where the expert says, um, ma'am, this is a very unique piece from the Victorian era, most likely created somewhere between 1850s to 1880s, maybe the 1890s. That if you look at the design, both in the front and a little bit in the back, that you'll realize that this was designed as a homage, as a way to honor the reign of Queen Victoria, who was only 18 years old when she enters into power. And if you look at it carefully, it actually gives some direction through this design to the Georgian era preceding it, as well as the Edwardian period after. And if you look even more carefully, you'll realize that there's this amazing, delicate design that speaks about the elaborate topography that was particularly unique during the Victorian era. And the woman who brings it goes, okay. <laughs> and then that special moment when the auctioneer, and I watch it for that moment, that one moment where the auctioneer says, uh, ma'am, this piece is worth over $7,000. And of course, the woman who brings it in, she's like, ah, woo -hoo! And I get into it myself. My wife says, are you okay? What I'm telling you is this. The reason why we could hope, have hope, because sometimes... We think there's just mundaneness, meaninglessness to our life. There's no uniqueness to you. It's just empty void. Now, I'm not going to break this dish because it belongs to Matt Wright. <laughs> but if I were to shatter this dish and it broke into hundreds of pieces, for some of us, all we look and all we see are shattered pieces of life. It's so all we see is brokenness, pain, scars. 
The reason why I'm urging you to have a deep eternal hope is your life is not meaningless. Our life isn't just broken pieces. You and I are fearfully, wonderfully, delicately made in the image of God. Friends, place your hope in that Jesus. And it will give you strength and meaning as we go through the brokenness of life. Revelation chapter 21 verse 4 says what? God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Thanks be to God. As you're able, can you rise to your feet at this time, friends? And I want to invite you, if you could, just open up your hands once more out of a, a symbol of receiving the presence of the Holy Spirit. And could you just bow your heads for a moment as we close in prayer? Father, we come before you as your children. We come not boasting in our righteousness, our eternal hope is not in me, in our spouse, our families. Our eternal hope is not in this world, it's in you. So we come to you placing our hope in you. And Father, at this time, I want to just pray for anyone here and ask for your healing power and touch on anyone that might be hurting or sick, ill. We want our faith to not be timid, but be bold in asking for the supernatural. So we pray for healing upon those who need healing in their bodies. God, we pray for meaning, those who feel lost and unsure, those who feel like there's no purpose in our life. I pray that Holy Spirit, you would speak so powerfully into every single person. Show us again that you are our God, our Father, our Lord and Savior, and that we are your beloved. And Father, we pray at this time for those who just simply see shattered, broken pieces. Holy Spirit, teach us, show us that you are a God who takes broken pieces together and make beautiful things. Restore us, redeem us, reconcile us. Our hope is in you. And friends, anyone here today, if you've never placed your trust in Jesus, today is your day. If you've never said yes to Jesus, I simply want you to repeat this prayer. Jesus, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I confess that I cannot save myself, that I've fallen short because of my sin. And I proclaim that you are Savior of my life, and I receive the presence and gift and power of the Holy Spirit into my life. In Jesus' name we pray, amen, amen. Friends, if any of you pray that prayer today, an amazing next step, and it's happening today, is introducing you to baptism. There's an opportunity for you to come forward. We'd love to speak with you, love to share about baptism. But remember, friends, you are God's handiwork, designed in His beautiful image. May you have hope in God. God bless you. We'll see you next week.